see the, the story of, I would have to say, my favorite character in the Bible. Mm. I love Saul and Paul. Mm. And we see that, that Saul was awesome, and Paul was awesome. And we, 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 in, in this, uh, we see Saul's conversion. Mm. And in Acts chapter 9, we see Luke's account of it. In Acts chapter 22, we see Paul's account of it. But I want to focus on, on Luke's account in Acts chapter 9. And we see that this is arguably the most powerful conversion that ever happened. Mm -hmm. Why do I say this? Is that Jesus, he came, he made the first disciples. And then after that, those disciples made every other disciple. Except for Paul. Mm. Jesus decided to come back just to make Paul into a disciple. Yeah. And we see what's really, what's really amazing and cool about this. And so the title of my lesson today is A Powerful Conversion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we look at Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked them for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So we see that, that Saul, in Acts chapter 8, he was the one that, that held the cloaks all, while all the Pharisees uh, stoned Stephen. So as, as I explained, that meant that he was taking responsibility for it. So he was the leader. He was the one that was saying, hey, I take responsibility for the killing of this man. And then immediately after that, he goes in Acts chapter 8 and he goes to house to house, destroying the church. Like, imagine that. You have someone, are you a Christian? Okay, go in there, take them to prison. Are you a Christian? Okay, take him to prison. And he just went from house to house to house, destroying the church. And he was so effective at it that he ran out of people to persecute him in Jerusalem, and he had to go to Damascus. He's like, all right, I'll come start here. Let's go off to this next place. And we see that in verse 3. It says, as he neared Damascus on the journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Jesus asked. Or Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. Mm -hmm. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. So he's there in Jerusalem destroying the church, going from house to house. Yeah. And then he leaves is super zealous, super fired up to go and destroy the church in Damascus. And along the way, he meets Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. He has a powerful encounter with Jesus, and it changes his whole life. And this is what we need to have, is that when we become a Christian, when we make, help someone else become a Christian, they have to have an encounter with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my first point. Point number one, an encounter with Jesus. Uh, I think that, that with... Um, with the, the first principles that we've been going through, we've been studying and learning about this, the first principles are great. But what some things, times that we can have happen is that we can get so focused on the intellectual side of our faith, of the doctrine, of the procedures, of the formulas, and we see that that's not how it works. Because Paul, Paul was pretty much, he was arguably the leading uh, guy of his day is that he said, he, he explains that he was well above all of his peers. He was above people his own age, people even further ahead of him. He trained under Gamaliel, which was the top Pharisee of his day. So this was a guy, this was like top of his class, and he was leading, he was going after it. So this guy, he knew his Bible. Without a doubt, he had the entire Old Testament memorized. And on top of that, he would have had uh, all of the additional teachings from all of the rabbis, the oral traditions, all this. This guy knew his Bible. But the problem is, is that he was so focused on the intellectualism of the theology that he wasn't really focused on God. Yeah. And this is what we see is that, that sometimes we can get focused on doctrine or theology and miss the point of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I know for myself, um, this was me. I, I, I like Saul because I really see a lot of myself in Saul. And that I wasn't necessarily someone that went around persecuting Christians, but I was someone that got so fixated on the intellectual side of faith. I got so fixated on the doctrine, on learning this, on learning that. Okay, let me go to the Greek. Let me go look at the culture. Let me go look at the history. Let's go study out this ancient artifact or that. And I got so bogged down in the minutia that I really wasn't focused on God at all. And I remember when I came to London, 
and I, I was looking for a church, and I, I had a very stringent list of criteria of what I wanted my church to have. It's gotta, it's gotta be this, it's gotta be this, it's gotta be all nations, it's gotta be international, they gotta preach the Bible, they gotta believe in evangelizing the world, and because I had become, um, in my own eyes, an expert on what the church should have been. I had spent like two years in Indonesia working as a, as a missionary. And that time, basically as a missionary, what it was, I just locked myself in my room, read books on theology, but I really wasn't actually doing it. I was just filling my head with knowledge. And the Bible says that knowledge puffs up, and that was me. I was puffed up with knowledge. I was wise in my own eyes. And so what happened was is that when I came to the church, I was just blown away. It's like, oh, this church is amazing. It's diverse, multicultural. They're loving. They're hardline on doctrine. They believe in evangelizing the world. This is exactly, this is perfect. Everything that I wanted, this is great. And I remember studying the Bible, and the first time that I studied the Bible was seeking God. I actually, I, like, I, I totally missed it. I, um, we started going through, and we went through some of the scriptures and stuff, and it was good, and I liked it. We got to Jeremiah 29, 11, and I was like, oh, this is great. And then I was like, oh, yeah, we're talking about the exile and all of this. And then they went to Ethiopian unit. And I was like, I, when it got to Jeremiah 29, I was like, oh, this is great. So, so what scripture do you guys want to look at next is what I asked. I was like, oh, let's go to Acts chapter 8. Perfect. I love that story. And we went, and like, oh, so what does this mean to you? And I went into, oh, yeah, well, with the, the eunuch, and this is what it meant with the, like, the Levitical law. He couldn't be a Jew. And so this is so powerful, and this and that. And I thought that I was, like, teaching them stuff. And that was in my head, because I was so, I, I missed it. I missed the whole point about seeking God. And the, the one thing about seeking God, like, go seek God with all of your heart. I went away that week, and I didn't do it. I had, like, maybe, like, two, three quiet times the, the whole week. And I went out that weekend with my colleagues. We went out uh, drinking and stuff. And I came back, and the next Sunday, I was like, man, I didn't seek God at all the last week. Because I wasn't really focused on Jesus. I wasn't focused on God. I was focused on myself, and I was focused on knowledge. And this was the same thing with Paul. Paul wasn't focused on God. He was focused on doing his religion, what he thought was best. And this is where we, we have to, to connect people with the cross. We have to connect people with Jesus. Otherwise, they're just going to have an intellectual faith. Yeah. And I remember sitting down with Anthony and with Michael at Costa Coffee in Camden. And I remember studying out discipleship. And I was so challenged by it. It was so hard. Because it challenged everything that I believed. Everything that I thought I knew about the Bible turned out to be wrong. And this is the same thing with Paul. Everything he thought, he's like, what, wait, wait, what? I thought I was protecting your church. I thought I was protecting Judaism. I thought I was, I was stopping this false doctrine. You're telling me that I'm actually persecuting you, God? Like, well, this doesn't make any sense. And it was super challenging. And when I, I went through it, is that my heart had become so hardened. Because what happens with intellectualism is that the, the bigger your brain gets, the harder your heart gets. <laughs> and um, all those hours on YouTube, listening to podcasts, reading books, it had hardened my heart so much to the point where uh, I hadn't cried in years and years. And I had people, close friends die, people left that I knew I would never see again, horrible heartbreaks in, in uh, relationships, with friendships, and nothing. Because my heart had become so hard because of my intellectualism. Yeah. But when I was in that study, when I really connected with the fact that I didn't get it, I wasn't focused on God, I was focused on myself, that's when I broke down and I cried for the first time in like many <coughs> years. And that was the turning point for me. Is that different people have it at different stages in the studies. But after that, I was a lot like Paul. I was like, all right, what am I going to do? And I, we, we see that um, Paul goes on after this. So this is what we got to do. Point number one, we got to get people focused on Jesus. Yeah. And for us to get other people focused on Jesus, we have to be focused on Jesus. Yeah. So if we go on in the story, it says in verse 10, In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said, Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. 
Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Amen. So point number one, we need to encounter Jesus. We cannot have an intellectual, rational type of faith. It needs to be focused on Jesus. And then point number two, when we have that faith, we need to understand that we're saved for a new purpose. And this was, was Saul's new purpose, is that Jesus, he came back. Because Saul was going to be the one that was going to proclaim the good news to the Gentiles. Peter was called for the Jews, but Saul, or Paul, was called to the Gentiles. And actually, people get a misconception about like Saul was the bad guy, Paul was the good guy. It's not actually that way. Saul is the Hebrew name for, for the guy, and Paul is his Greek, or Gentile name. So the reason why we think of Paul, 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 is because that's predominantly who he was with. He was mostly with Gentiles, so he used his Gentile name. But it's, it's um, we see that, that, that Saul and Paul, same guy, and they were, they were chosen by God for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. And this is us, is that all of us, when we have this powerful conversion experience, when we really encounter Jesus, we have to understand that now our life is, is about a new purpose is that we're called to go out and to preach the good news. Saul was called specifically to preach to the Gentiles, and he, we know he preached to Jews as well, but all of us are called for a specific purpose, and we have to understand that. I remember um, one of the things is that I was so intellectual, so rational, I was so inward looking in my faith, that was uh, so challenging for me, was when I was like, no, no, it's not about you, it's about going out. Jesus' first command was go and make disciples. His last command was go and make disciples. Mm. Jesus wanted to have an outward faith, is that we're saved for a purpose, and that purpose is to go and save others. Yeah. Yeah. I think Paul, he, he understood this. Paul knew that he was a special guy. Paul struggled with pride. And um, I, I myself, I'm the same way. Like, I, I, no one had to tell me that I was special. I thought, oh yeah, I'm special. I'm gonna do this for God. I remember getting baptized. Like, right, I'm gonna go plant like churches all over Europe. It's gonna be awesome. I just, that's just how I was raised. I was raised with people believing in me, building me up. And I, I, was, I always knew that I was called to do something great by God. But I think many of us, in, especially in the London culture, we don't think that way. We don't think that we're someone that's special. We don't think that we're someone that's going to do great things for God. And I want to challenge that. I think that, that Paul, he understood that he was going to do great things for God, and he did do great things for God. Not because he was awesome, but because he knew his calling and he was used by God. Mm. I think for us, for us to really go about and to do great things, it's not going to be about us. It's not about our personal talents or our personal charisma. It's about God, but it's about us knowing that we're called by God. I um, <clears throat> when I when I got baptized, I like I said, I got baptized. I came up out of the water. I want to be an evangelist. I want to go planting churches all over the world. And I was so fired up. I was enthusiastic. I was zealous to go and share my faith. And I remember walking down the streets. I was walking down Warren Street, and like I was just looking at all these people, and I started like just crying. I was like crying down there, like, this person's going to hell, this person's going to hell, this person's going to hell, oh God, I need to start saving people. <laughs> and, yeah, right. and I just, I, was, I had a really soft heart at this stage. And I, I just shared with everybody. It was just, it was a natural thing of what I did. And I remember going to uh, get a haircut, and I had this cool uh, Romanian guy, and started chatting with him, this cool guy. And I, was, I, I almost didn't share with him. But I was like, well, no, I've been sharing with everyone else, so I want to share with this guy too. And I shared, I was like, hey, would you like to study the Bible? I didn't even ask if he believes in God, are you a Christian, do you go to church? No, would you like to study the Bible? And he's like, you know what, I would love to study the Bible. And I was kind of a little bit taken back. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, yeah, really. Like, let's get together and study the Bible. And we did. We got together, we studied the Bible with him. He came to church, and I was in there. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I remember in the, the first study, I, I led the first study, 
and I, I thought I did a pretty good job. And then the next study, I tried to like hijack it from my design book. And so I was like, wait, wait, no, no, no. This is actually what the scripture is saying. And you're just trying to take control of it. And I got rebuked afterwards. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> But I was just, I was so fired up. I was so zealous. I had a little bit of zeal without knowledge. But I just, I wanted to make disciples. I knew that that was my new purpose. Because before my purpose was all about me. I came to London. I wanted to basically to live as comfortable and luxurious and adventurous of a life that I could. I wanted to, I wanted to go to be a consultant, to be able to work with these big companies, what I, which would have meant I made a lot of money, I would have been able to travel, I was really passionate about salsa dancing, I wanted to go party, that's, that's what I wanted to do. But then when I became a disciple, I realized, no, no, I want to go and make other disciples. Mm-hmm. And the also thing about Joe is that a, a month after I got baptized, he got baptized. Yeah. And which is awesome is I really want to lift up um, Haven. Because Haven, he got baptized, what was it, three months ago? Four months ago? Five months ago. Five months ago. February? Come on. March, April, May, June. Four months ago. He wants to be five. It feels like it's been five, but it's only four. <laughs> but oh, I, I remember uh, studying the Bible with Haven. I remember the first time I met Haven. It was awesome. Getting in there, studying the Bible with him. And Haven was a lot like me. He was very intellectual. He was very religious. Very inward focused on himself. But once Haven really encountered Jesus, when he understood, hey, it's not about me, it's not about religion, it's not about what I know, it's about God. Mm-hmm. And once he really understood his new purpose, he's gone after it. Mm-hmm. And he's, going, he's been sharing his faith, he's been meeting people, he's been doing awesome stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's been really encouraging having Haven in the studies with Andy. Mm-hmm. Because Haven, he's a young disciple, he hasn't been a disciple for very long. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't maybe know everything, he doesn't know the first principles inside of, he doesn't know all the doctrine. But he knows that he's called by God to make disciples. Mm-hmm. And now Haven's going to help me baptize Andy today. <laughs> so I want to challenge you guys to go away. And I want you to think about your purpose. But not just say, okay, I'm a disciple, I'm called to make disciples. That's just like a, a, a phrase that we just say, and we say it so often, it doesn't really mean anything. But you got to really think, like, man, do I really believe that I'm called by God? Not called by God to go into the ministry, like, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that. No, I'm, I'm called by God to be a disciple that makes disciples. Because if you don't believe that you're called by God to do great things, you're not going to do great things. If you don't believe that you're called by God to make disciples, you're not going to make disciples. And if you haven't been making disciples... Maybe you're in sin, maybe you're this, maybe you're that, but maybe it's just you just don't believe. You just don't believe that God really can use you. And I want to challenge that. I want to challenge you to let go of that negative thing. I want to challenge you to go away and to really write down a little, a letter to yourself. Write down your calling. Say like, hey, today, this day, I know that I'm called by God to go and to make disciples. And when you... When you doubt, and you, you try studying with someone, you try sharing your faith, and it maybe doesn't happen. Or you study with someone, and it doesn't, they don't make it. I want you to pull out that letter. And I want you to remind yourself, hey, I'm just like Paul. I'm called by God to do great things. I believe that God's going to use me to do great things, because that's what it says in his word. Mm-hmm. Good, guys? Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> we go to the last part here. We see um, in verse... Second part of verse 19. It says, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't this a man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who were called by his name? He hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews in Damascus by proving that he is the Messiah. In verse uh, 25, it talks about he gave spirits some persecution, and it says, But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through the opening of the wall. The word here for followers is disciples. So we know that when we need to encounter Jesus, it's not about intellectual faith. We know that now, once we encounter Jesus and become disciples, we're called to a new purpose. But what I want to say is that the, the new purpose, it starts today. That's right. It's not about waiting six months. It's not about waiting a year. It's not about waiting two years. 
Today, you're called to that new purpose. Today, you're called to go and make, go and make disciples. And we see that, that, that Saul, we don't know who was with him. Maybe he went with Ananias. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he had other disciples that met him. Oh, bro, we love you. Probably not, though. Because, you know, Ananias, he, he was probably the leader of the church. That's why God went to him. And Ananias was scared of Saul. He didn't want to be around him. So probably most of the other disciples were scared of him. They're like, is he really a disciple? I heard this guy, like, destroyed the church in Jerusalem. Like, I don't, I don't want to go share my faith with him. <laughs> and so he most likely just went by himself. He showed up to the synagogue, started preaching the word. And we see that people were confused. They're like, what? What's, what's going on? And it's, it's the powerful. It shows the power of Jesus, the power of the cross, is that it doesn't matter who you were before. Who you were is dead. Once you get into those waters of baptism, all of that's gone. All of that's forgotten. And now you have a new purpose and you have a new life. Mm. Yeah, come on. And with that, with that new purpose and that new life, you're called to go and to make disciples. And Saul here, yeah, he was an extraordinary individual. But we see that he just went with faith and God blessed that faith. We see that even in a matter of days, already he's making disciples. Mm. And this is the call for all of us. The call for us is to go out just like Saul. Not to be waiting for it, not to be waiting for, for things to change, but just go out, preach the word, be disciples that make disciples. Mm -hmm. Are you with me, guys? Yeah. 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 So my challenge for you is very simple, is I want you guys to, to go out sharing your faith, with faith, believing that you're called by God, and to go get just one study. Just one study. And because when I, I met Andy, I went out and I was challenged by, um, by Michael. He's like, bro, you gotta go out. You gotta go find the study. Don't stop waiting for someone else to meet someone sharing. Stop waiting for someone else. Because if I'm honest, I don't like sharing my faith. It's not my favorite thing to do. I like Bible studies. I like preaching. I like singing. I don't like sharing my faith. <laughs> but I was, I was challenged because, hey, we didn't really have any studies. And so I went off to Stratford. I've got a little place behind Westfield that I like to go and pray. And I went and I prayed. And I just started sharing my faith. Share my faith with this guy? No. Share my faith with this guy? No. Share my faith with this guy? No. And I, I went and I saw Andy from a distance. And he, Andy, he's got a haircut and a bit of a beard trim. I, I couldn't see. At first, I thought he was Muslim. And I was like, I thought, like, I'm not even going to share my faith with him. He's Muslim. He's not going to be open. And I was like, no, I have to, you got to convert Muslims too. So I went, and I went and I shared my faith with him. And he's like, yeah, of course. I, I believe in God. I, I, um, we talked about the King James Version Bible. I was like, perfect. Let's get together. And it was just that simple. You just go, you just find that one person. And I didn't even have to share. It's not like I shared. Some people talk about sharing with 100 people, and it's the 101st person that gets baptized. For me, I didn't have it even that hard. He was like the fourth person. <laughs> Come on, Andy. Hey, and so, I want to challenge you guys. Maybe it's the fourth person. Maybe you just don't, you don't even want to share with that first person. So you don't even, you can't do, you don't get to the fourth one. But I want to challenge you guys to go out this week, share your faith until you get one study. And then when you have that one study, that could be the one person that gets baptized. Mm -hmm. Because this is the one study right here. Andy. Come on, Andy. And so this is, uh, this is my lesson for you guys. This is my, my sermonian, is that we can't be intellectual. We can't be focused on the doctrine or the, the systems or the first principles. We have to be focused on Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because it's the encounter with Jesus. That's the power that really produces a conversion. And that's the power that keeps us converted. That's the power that keeps us saved. Even after you get baptized, you still have to keep coming back to the foot of the cross. You have to keep coming back to focusing on Jesus and not focusing on religion or theology. Is that once we, once we understand this, we understand that we're, we're have, we have a new purpose to go out and to make disciples. We have to believe that we're called by God. Believe that God really wants us to go and make disciples. And then once we believe that, we need to, we need to do it today. Not wait for tomorrow, not wait for someone else to go and share their faith and to bring you a study, but you go out, you go share your faith, you get that study, and we're going to have more people like Andy, we're going to have more people yeah. like Jennifer. Hey. Right. How awesome would it be if we had 10 people like Andy? Oh. Oh. How awesome would it be if we had 10 people like Jennifer? Oh. Oh. Who's going to go get them? You guys are going to go get them. Yeah. Oh. So go out, share your faith, be disciples that make disciples. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.